Welcome everyone to Tools of the Trade, Trends and Developments in IP Valuation and Dealmaking Data and Internet Tools. This is a one hour panel and we'll open it up for live Q&A during the last 15 minutes of this hour. My name is Afrat Kaznik and I'm an IP Valuation um, expert based in Silicon Valley, a president of Foresight Valuation Group. I'm also chair of the LES Valuation and Pricing Committee, the committee uh, that put together this program. Our goal here is to assist anyone who's engaged in IP monetization deals who's looking for benchmarking data for deals that they're working on. IP dealmakers don't always know what data tools exist or to look for data. And this panel, uh, we are looking to raise the curtain on the tools of the trade and provide a deep dive into some state of the art IP and internet related data tools. Um, I would like to briefly introduce our panel and please feel free to check the detailed bios and links on the event page uh, on the LES website. Uh, first, we have Kent Richardson, CEO at Richardson Oliver Insights, where he supports customers in developing data-driven strategies based on patent market data and insights. Kent has personally participated in patent deals exceeding $600 million in value. Welcome, Kent. Uh, next, we have Dave Weiler, founder and managing director of Royalty Source. Uh, providing data on market-based patent and IP licensing and sales transactions since 1997, as well as ipsio.com, an online gateway to patent research. Welcome, Dave. Our next panelist is Sam Wiley, Connected Innovation Intelligence Evangelist at PatSnap. Sam has two decades of experience spanning the entire innovation and IP ecosystem. Sam is also the incoming chair of the LES Valuation and Pricing Committee. Welcome, Sam. Finally, we have Doug Banya, founding principal of Vium IP Consultants, who has extensive experience as an expert on over 75 cases, providing opinions related to the value of internet traffic, including impressions, lists, and likes. Welcome, Doug. Our hour today um, will have each of our speakers uh, review the data tool that they specialize in. We'll start with Kent talking about patent and pricing data, Next, moving over to Dave, who's gonna cover royalty rates. Um, Sam is going to introduce uh, the concept of innovation data points. And finally, we're gonna have Doug discuss internet metrics. Um, we'll then jointly discuss the future of, what the future holds for IP valuation and how our experts see deal making and data and IP valuation to evolving in the next five years. Then we'll move to questions and open it to questions for the audience. Kent, I invite you to kick us off uh, with an overview of patent market price data. Great, thank you. And what I'm gonna walk you through today is an example of how you can use patent market price data to help you sort of estimate what a deal price might be for a big portfolio. And this is something that you might have to do, uh, let's imagine you're an in-house person, Intel in this case has brought a big portfolio to the market, and you might have some sense that, yeah, that might be interesting to us, but we don't have an allocated budget. We don't know how big a deal this is gonna be. Is this something that we can take on? And really the, the first question is about how much it might it cost? And we're, we're looking at the factors from uh, a market price point of view, not the value to you. And I think that's an important distinction here, okay? So, Intel brings this portfolio to the market. It's 450-ish, 440 uh, patents and applications, 83 families. And really, you know, the first question is, should you spend any time uh, evaluating this? Now, maybe you, you, first thing you do is you try to get the list of the patents, but you don't even, may not even have that yet. And the question is going to be asked, should we spend time on this? Is this a deal we can get done? If it's $500 million, well, that's not a deal that maybe you want to do today. Or if it's $5 million, maybe you're really all excited about it. But right now, you have this problem of your boss comes in and she says to you, well, what's about the price that we're looking at here? And how do we know that, um, that we should spend the time and energy on this? And, you know, should we go spend the money somewhere else? So we provide uh, market data. And this is an example of the kind of market data. And what, what this is, is it shows you the asking prices for uh, different patent packages 
on a per family basis that's available on the open market. So if you ask accountants to do a value of market price, what they'll try to do is they'll try to find a number of comparable deals and then do sort of adjustments. Now, the nice thing about uh, the market data that we have is we have hundreds of deals and we can provide a lot of guidance around those asking prices and we publish this. So you can pull um, our market da report down from our, our uh, website and get in and start to look at these histograms of pricing and say, okay, so where is it? So Efrat, next please. Do we think the price is gonna be really low? Maybe not. Maybe it's gonna be something moving this direction or, or do we think it might be really high up here? Now, if you take those, those families, and there's 86 of them, and you said it was $2 million a family, now you're looking at a, like a $160 million deal. Or if you're saying it was $200,000 per family, you're looking at a $16 million deal. Huge variation here. So we're trying to figure out, you know, are we closer to 16 or seems unlikely that we'd be closer to that uh, 160 million. So one of the things that you can look at when you're looking at, okay, where do you think you are on this price curve, right? So there's all these prices and do we think that we're closer to one end or the other end of the price? Um, so we know large portfolios tend to have a, a, a sell less at a lower price. We know that claim charts increase the price. We know that the seller, when the seller is selling directly, they tend to get a higher price. We can make some adjustments for technology we can make adjustments knowing that standards related patents tend to uh, sell higher and that if there's good international coverage, you might get better pricing. So those are kinds of simple adjustments that you can look at fairly quickly and say, well, probably we're moving this way or we're moving that way up and down that histogram. So you start maybe at the median price and you might move up or you might move down depending on, on factors like this. And the nice thing about this is, remember, you're looking for a ballpark answer. You're not ask, asking yourself, what's the bid price we're going to go in at? What's the strategy? What you're trying to figure out is whether we need to spend any time on this at all. Is this a deal that we can get done? And if you start to look at those factors, you can see that you moved maybe off of that two to 300K, moving higher into the five to 500, 600, 700K per family but really not at the 2 million price point, And you're definitely not at the 100,000 per family. Now you can figure out what that deal would look like. And you're looking at about 40, 60, $80 million, somewhere in that range. And you can do this relatively quickly. I mean, this is sort of a half a day to two days worth of work to get that ballpark, to be able to answer that question for your boss. And I think that's where I'd like all of us to be able to do. You know, when I graduated from law school, I would have loved to have this class. Right, like here's how you do this. So you can answer these business related questions really quickly and then make the, the legal decisions about diligence. Great, uh, thank you, Kent. This is um, absolutely critical data that I would think um, any IP deal maker, especially dealing with patents would like to have. Uh, my question for you is who would you like to see using this data that is not currently using it? Well, so I'd like to see it more broadly uh, accessible and people become more comfortable with it. So the in-house folks, there are folks who are in-house that do use this kind of data pretty regularly to price, price deals. But there is some like, you know, we need more success stories. We need more people using it to be comfortable. You know, as lawyers, we grew up learning how to use Microsoft Word and maybe not so much Excel. This is the kind of, we need to figure out how to use Excel and make estimates and feel comfortable about that when we're um, using this kind of data. So there's a, there's a, a knowledge and an experience of using this data that I, I would like to see more broadly available so that people can make these decisions quickly without pulling out their checkbook to, to pay lawyers for diligence on deals they don't wanna do. I mean, that's, that's really, the big idea, or have a much better sense of where the price is and then actually kind of be able to dig in and do the diligence. So that's what I'd like to see. So a broader, broader spectrum of people feeling comfortable using this, probably a lot of in-house people. Yeah, so, so maybe even as early as law school where, where lawyers are, are getting- I, that I, you know, I have taught some of your uh, class for you on occasions. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much, Kent. Um, moving on today for a discussion of royalty rate, um, benchmark and data. Yeah, let's, uh, we'll just ride on the coattails of a market of approach. Uh, but instead of looking for patent uh, prices, we're going to look for uh, royalty rates. So I just want to jump in and introduce uh, some tools um, to benchmark royalty rates for licensing uh, or uh, litigation or uh, valuation. Uh, essentially, it uh, depends upon your need. So uh, if there's an internal requirement that's uh, quick and easy, high level reports uh, are a good way to start uh, and get that assignment complete. The LES uh, survey reports, uh, high tech, chemical, and uh, biotech are, are great starting points for a quick review uh, for uh, internal purposes. However, uh, if you need uh, more in-depth research and more detailed review, um, you're gonna have to move to some type of online tool and search. But however, I wouldn't uh, abandon the high level reports because they offer great boundaries. So to the extent that you find market-based royalty rates uh, using an online tool and your conclusion uh, for whatever purpose is beyond the boundary, you better have a good uh, reason <laughs> or explanation of why you're above or below those boundaries. Not to say that those are the true boundaries, you just need to make sure your report is, uh, is uh, supportable. Using an online, online tool, I, I've discovered that there's just some basic stuff up front you need to understand uh, so you don't spin your wheels when searching uh, online tools. Uh, the uh, subject IP, you have to understand that and it's end use. <laughs> uh, I know it sounds simple, but uh, for example, sensor technology uh, could be your subject IP and sensors can be used multiple places uh, in different industries. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the data I found in the renewable, industry, renewable energy industry and solar. So um, I'm gonna say that, you know, I'm gonna focus my analysis and use on the solar industry. Um, the other thing that you need to know up front is there's not an exact comparable. I'm sure everybody's been through the searches of online, uh, using online tools. Um, so when you're in there searching, you need to make sure you tag some similar licenses uh, right out of the gate. So don't drive by those. Um, then basics, you know, make sure you understand your industry. So I'm going to talk a little bit about renewable energy. Um, assemble some keyword rich content. Uh, you know, your online tool could have a Boolean keyword match or a semantic search that understands uh, natural language. That's, we offer that in, at the Ipsio self-service uh, option. Um, but at some point you may just be overwhelmed by the number of uh, similar licenses that you have. So you can always uh, add more parameters to narrow that collection of licenses down to a more reasonable uh, count. So the result of the guideline license summary uh, here uh, results in uh, looking at renewable energy first, and then I took a subset solar. So it gave me a big, pic big picture of the renewable energy industry and my target. Uh, you'll see that on the left, I've simply uh, summarized royalty rate data uh, metrics and uh, to give me an idea of uh, what the industry looks like. Uh, for solar, you can see I found 33 licenses. Um, and I've also created on the right there, uh, the license characteristics. So those characteristics help me understand these guideline license uh, royalty rates. So for example, um, I found 33 licenses uh, for solar. And if we look at the license characteristics uh, uh, panel, uh, you'll see that 22 of those licenses are exclusive in nature. Um, so if your technology uh, license is uh, target or is non-exclusive, then these 
summary data for royalty rates may be a little high and need to be adjusted uh, downward or tempered a bit. Uh, so that's kind of how I think about uh, selecting a uh, market-based uh, royalty rate for my subject IP. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, adjustments. Over time, <laughs> this body of knowledge has developed uh, since I started looking for these data. And this body of knowledge it helps me understand the directional adjustments that are needed to royalty rates uh, so that it could make, make it more comparable to your subject IP. So these are quantitative in nature and qualitative in nature. Uh, so uh, I'd be happy to share uh, the body of knowledge that I've accumulated over time uh, with you if you just drop me an email, but uh, I would like to learn more about this area and uh, these directional adjustments. So um, that's all I have for you. Uh, let me ask you, um, I mean, I've, I've, I've been an IP valuation expert for, for 25 years and yes. is like one of your key and I've used your data from day one. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan and we always found good data in your database. Um, so over the last um, 20, you've been doing this since 1997, um, and I know royalty rates are not easy to find. How would you characterize the changes in data collection challenges over time when it comes to the data, the data yeah, um, royalty rate data? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's become more automated on our side. Uh, I remember searching individually for that information and uh, populating our uh, data set. <laughs> Fortunately, automation has uh, helped significantly and search tools have helped significantly. Um, so, um, but we still need an, a review. Some eyeball or some analyst needs to understand the record so to build the data set. Um, but, uh, and in terms of, there was an increasing volume over time uh, because of we were uh, started the uh, market and uh, now it's kind of leveled off and flat and I don't see any real decline in the number of publicly reported licenses. So uh, I think uh, the challenge is going to be finding more. <laughs> okay, so no decline, but also no increase, right? So right, exactly. I'm not, I'm not disclosing more than they have to. And that, that's right, the problem exactly. always. Okay, okay, good. Good. Thank you so much. That's uh, always always good to to, uh, to to review the challenges of royalty rates, which is uh, we, we sometimes take for granted, and, and <laughs> it's not. Um, okay, next to you, Sam, uh, and um, we're we're looking forward to hearing all about uh, <laughs> innovation data points. Yeah, no. So this uh, this really ties in well to what Kent and David were talk talking about. We're really, um, I think, when we're talking about supporting deal makers or decision makers. It's really providing more data for making decisions. Um, I'm gonna be talking about measuring innovation. Um, and this is gonna be a case study about using leading and lagging indicators uh, to measure innovation. So I'm gonna be talking about innovation data points. And when I talk about innovation data points, I'm talking about things people who make decisions in deal making and IP are, are often used to. Um, uh, innovation data point is just an objective quantifiable external evidence of innovation. When I say innovation, I'm talking about is this really inventive? Is it creative? Is it changing things? Um, we're not talking so much about sort of just the legal value of a patent. So the ability to protect revenue or something like that. It's more like, is this representative of innovation? Uh, two of the more traditional data points that we often use for measuring innovation, and you'll see this in mainstream news and in uh, you know, company level decision-making, um, there's R&D spend. Uh, we're not gonna talk about that a lot today. I, I don't think it's the best measure of innovation. Um, because it's cost-based, it's an accounting term. Um, you can spend tons and tons of money on R&D and not have much to show for it. You can uh, get very lucky and spend next to nothing and have a lot of innovation. I still think R&D spends a good bench benchmark. If you are looking at a company that is similar to you or a country that's similar to you and they're spending a lot more, it's, it's interesting to think about, well, why is that? You know, maybe, maybe we're more efficient or maybe we, we should be um, spending a bit more money. Um, patents, though, those are the gold standard in, in, for most people when it comes to measuring innovation. They're uh, very objective. Um, you know, some patent office has reviewed this and determined that there's some novelty and everything else that goes into the um, 
the prosecution process that, that makes it a pretty objective um, data point. It's very publicly available by definition. The, the whole sort of trade-off with patents is that you're exchanging um, a temporary monopoly um, in exchange for, for providing information about the invention. So for, by definition, it's publicly available. And then it's their technical documents, they're text rich, they're easy to analyze. So they're sort of the gold standard for measuring innovation. And again, you often see this in sort of the mainstream news. Someone will be trying to figure out, well, what's the, the new innovation hotbed? Is it Atlanta, Georgia? And they'll compare the number of patent applications or something like that. It's something, um, you know, even kind of, uh, uh, you know, maybe not quite every person on the street, but, but a, a business uh, publication reader is familiar with using patents as sort of a stand in for how creative a place or a company is. Uh, next slide. Um, so why, why do we need to look beyond patents? So uh, patents are always going to be a great choice for measuring innovation. There's some nuances. So um, probably everyone in attendance here, and certainly everyone on this call knows that the 18th month, month window refers to the publication window. So after you file for a patent, it doesn't become public for 18 months. There are thousands and thousands of loopholes to that. So uh, we're not gonna get hung up on those today, but what it does uh, cause a problem for is um, either you're a very sophisticated uh, IP uh, information consumer, and you know this is true, and, and you know sort of how to work with that and go, okay, just because we see this huge drop off in applications in a certain technology area uh, in this chart. I know why that is. Um, or you're, you're probably more likely a business user or a policymaker who doesn't understand that, or if you do understand it, you don't know quite what to do with that information. Um, that causes some, some problems using patent data to measure innovation. Um, you can see there's a little game controller icon up on the screen. Uh, that's because not all companies, industries, or technologies use patents extensively. So the entertainment industry is a really good example of an industry that's very innovative, very creative, um, you know, doing some really amazing things from an innovation perspective. And uh, maybe patents aren't necessarily the first thing that comes to mind with their most creative people. Um, so if I was trying to figure out who the most creative entertainment company is, who the most innovative, uh, patents may not always be the perfect data point probably still a pretty good supplement though. Um, and then uh, probably this is the biggest one is uh, uh, patents aren't always tied to a clearly innovative, clearly tied to innovative products. You could have uh, a patent application um, and, you know, there's always, again, going back to mainstream news stories, you'll see a company like Amazon files a patent for this giant flying ship that launches drones to deliver pizzas and other uh, Amazon goods. Um, and people think, oh, wow, they're building that. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Maybe Amazon wants to do that, maybe they're doing this just sort of uh, for a different patent strategy, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that there's definitely innovation in that area. Um, for all of these reasons, I consider patents to be a lagging indicator. Uh, this is something we specialize in at PatSnap. So this is really what we've been focusing on. Our, our, we've got the word patent in the title because we start with patent data, but we've moved on to other data points um, as have many of the other vendors and our competitors. It's kind of the direction the industry is heading in. Um, for the reasons I just mentioned, but there's other data points we can use that are more like leading indicators. They kind of show what could be happening in the near future, right now, or in the far future. Um, some of these examples are research papers, uh, technology news, uh, startup data, government research grants, uh, market insights from the different uh, research firms, uh, M&A activity, uh, clinical trial data for the life sciences, and then conference pr proceedings. Uh, these are all leading indicators. Uh, if, if a bunch of papers are happening in an area, that's an indication that activity is going on there, even if I don't see patent activity. There could be lots of reasons for that. It may not be the right area for patents, or maybe they just haven't gotten there yet. Um, and we want to look at these indicators as well. Leading indicators also have their own downside. So um, there's recency bias. If I read something as, as exciting and technology news, I might think that is the, the big thing. Or I might read a story saying, you know, this amazing new technology center has appeared in a certain country. Um, it may maybe overstate, I may have an emotional reaction, I have a recency bias on that. Uh, these other types of data are not nearly as easy to index or standardize as patents. They just don't have that same level of sort of public availability and um, ability to index. Uh, obviously, you can have differing journalistic and peer review standards. A research paper in nature is going to be different than um, a tech blogger. Just by definition, you're going to have differences in how you can weigh those. Uh, public availability of data is very different. So a lot of the uh, things I mentioned in the previous slide might be behind something along the lines of paywall, or they may be some a report you have to purchase. And then there's a speculativity issue around research papers and things like that, where the could be a very exciting technology, but it may, may never actually come to pass. It may be um, something that they're hoping will happen. So there's a, 
uh, maybe, uh, you know, if, if patents are lagging, maybe some of those other data points are too far in the future. So this is a, a, a case study of how we combined at PatSnap public, or sorry, leading and lagging indicators into one comprehensive view. Uh, it is not for IP deal makers. This was actually for the United Nations IDARE. It's an organization with, within the United Nations that looks at digital health and, and AI. And they wanted to do sort of this understanding on how uh, state of innovation with digital health um, with AI the folks at the UN realized fairly early on that they weren't going to be able to just look at patents because of the lagging nature of that data. Um, in this case, the, the other primary data point was research papers, um, but they wanted to combine those into kind of a common view and really kind of go, okay, this will give us a more comprehensive view of, uh, you know, how digital health is shaping up in different parts of the world. Another kind of example of sort of the, um, you know, need to combine different data types was that the regions you see for patents, which is just basically patent offices, and in some cases, regional patent offices. Um, and for research papers, which is typically where's that university or institution located, um, weren't quite the right region they looked at. And so if you kind of look in the lower corner of the screen, we had to create some custom regions. But really the idea here is we wanted to give the UN and they're gonna present this uh, whenever the next World Economic Forum is. And um, that is obviously way, way, way above my pay grade. Um, there's going to be a live economic forum. Uh, this data will be presented in that forum. And the intent is to, to help uh, policymakers and business leaders at the biggest companies, the biggest banks, uh, things of that nature, make decisions around, hey, how do we make uh, digital health, health and AI more equitable? Where's the research going on? How do we share the wealth? Um, really kind of, uh, you know, the decisions aren't that different than the sorts of decisions you might want to support as an IP deal maker, which is, am I working with the right companies? Are we doing research in the right area? If I want to build a new technology center in a certain region, is, is that the best one for, for my industry? Um, the importance of combining these leading and lagging indicators is about the, you know, it, the, the questions that the policymakers at the UN are trying to answer aren't that different than an IP deal maker. And what we're going for is just to try to make an apples, apples analysis. We're trying to make the leading and lagging indicators such that when I say, hey, this is a, this paper and this patent application are both suggestive of uh, innovation in the diagnostics area um, in this region, that we really are making that apples to apples comparison. Um, so that's my presentation. It's something I'm obviously super excited about. If anyone ever wants to talk about this, um, I'm always excited to talk about it. Pat, I'm obviously excited to talk about it. I think there's some other really great uh, research going on at some of our, um, I don't know if I call it competitors or vendors or, or other, other players in the market. I, there's a lot of really interesting work going on in this space. Thank you, Sam. And I've, I've always been an advocate as a, as a user of patent analytics to including more indicators. And, and I think th this is exactly going in the right direction. Uh, my question for you is, um, it's, seems like the lagging indicators are, are more documented in databases and, and are um, easier to find, but not necessarily as indicative, whereas the lagging indicators, uh, excuse me, the leading indicators are, are more telling, but a little more difficult to, to collect and, and analyze. How do you reconcile these two types of indicators? So for this, this case study, this project, this was a very manual process. Um, we actually had, we do have technology we've developed in-house that um, will make its way into the products eventually. Um, for this case, that apples to apples comparison required a lot of manual effort. We are developing those tools right now, and I'm, I'm sure other folks in the industry are working on, on things that are similar, but it's really trying to find, you know, what, what's the sweet spot for AI or machine learning to be able to, to say two documents are similar. So, you know, something we've been thinking a lot about is, is say, standards. Um, you know, could a machine learning bot read the text of a standard and then read some part of a patent application or patent and go, I'm more likely, you know, 51% sure this needs someone else to look at it, or, you know, more likely than not, this, this standard and this patent seem to be talking about the same thing. Um, that same process should apply to research papers. Um, you know, something we were looking at at PatSap right now that I'm really excited about is, is looking at countries where there's, uh, you know, maybe not the easiest to find foreign language press so the technology business and countries where, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is really important. So places like Turkey and Nigeria, um, you know, 
looking at that local business press and, and, and comparing that to research papers and patent applications and getting a really comprehensive view of, oh, this is a really interesting, this is a country or a region I don't know much about personally, you know, I'm, let's say I'm a business leader in San Francisco, but I want to know what's going on in these uh, really important uh, up and coming markets. Um, being able to tie all that together and, and have an AI do most of the work for me before I get into the data, I think will really um, drive better decision making and, and, and I, I'm really excited about it. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Um, move to you, Doug. Um, and um, what can you tell us about, uh, I think something that very few of us know anything about, uh, internet analytics tools. Great, uh, thank you so much. So today I'm going to introduce you to an internet tool I use quite often in uh, valuation and damages assignments related to trademark, publicity rights, uh, and internet and social media disputes. So it's important to remember that the use of the internet and social media in business today is a modern day requirement and calculating damages and performing valuations in this new world is required. Google provides a free keyword planner tool uh, for use when you're building an AdWords pay-per-click program for advertising online. And this tool assists with determining the amount of search traffic and the pay-per-click price for the chosen keywords. And the keyword planner is free and it's available to anybody uh, that has online access. And I use this keyword planner for a different reason. And one of those reasons is to obtain a quick snapshot of a trademark's online value and reach. And you can sign up for this tool right at this URL that's listed on the screen. So after logging into the uh, Google Keyword Planner, you'll see various input fields that you can modify. In step one, um, you wanna type in the phrase, name, or trademark uh, that you're investigating. As shown here, I use the term intellectual property valuation and then you would click the blue get results button. That would take you to step two, um, where you can modify the location field, which allows you to narrow your search by country, state, and you can even drill down to specific zip codes. And you can also change the date range from the default. Google has a default uh, date range of the last 12 months. And I think we all know often when you're performing an evaluation or a damages opinion, we're going back in time to a specific a date range. So this date range field is quite useful. Then in step three, you're going to find the number of average monthly searches, the level of competition, and the suggested pay-per-click price a business should pay to have their Google ad appear at the top of the Google search results. And I'll stop real quick and just remind you, you know, this tool is built for Google Ads users, but I use it to get a quick snapshot of online value for a specific uh, time and location. So at the time I ran the tool, there were 90 searches a month for intellectual property valuation, which is very low compared to say, uh, you know, the search for intellectual property, which has over 40,000 uh, searches per month. Uh, the competition is low meaning the average number of advertisers bidding on intellectual property valuation relative to all keywords across Google is very small. The suggested low range and high range pay-per-click prices tell you that you should at least set your pay-per-click price bid range from $2.56 to $11.28 for your Google ad to appear at the top of the first page of the Google search results. You know, again, Google wants your ads to appear and you know, when there is competition, they're gonna give you this pay-per-click uh, range so your ad appears on the first uh, page of Google search results. Um, this Google Keyword Planner will give you a quick snapshot of online value for a trademark. Now, I often use it when a potential client calls and asks about a brand valuation or a brand extension, and I can quickly determine the number of clicks and the price uh, per click online. As valuation professionals and damages experts, you know, the projects we work on are confidential. This case study discusses a case that went to trial, so I'm uh, able to share the details. Uh, my client was a defendant in a trademark lawsuit, and they ma manufactured furniture using the name Stone Creek, uh, which was a trademark owned by the plaintiff. And my task was to quantify damages and address was the trademark contributing to commerce and did the use of the trademark benefit the defendant? 
And to answer these questions, one of the tools I used was a Google's keyword planner. So again, the defendant manufactured furniture for the client Stone Creek, and the furniture was sold by the plaintiff in the Arizona area only. So the defendant, my client, later started manufacturing furniture for another client, uh, which was the Bonton stores, and they had seven retail locations in a completely different trading territory. The defendant used the name Stone Creek on the furniture it manufactured for the Bonton stores without obtaining permission from their client Stone Creek and was sued for trademark infringement. So using this keyword tool, I was able to identify the number of searches for the term Stone Creek for the seven Bonton stores by zip code. And then I compared that number to the number of searches for the actual store name. And as shown in the chart, searches for the store name were in the thousands and searches for Stone Creek was you know, zero to 70. So I then used the keyword tool to show the name Stone Creek was searched for approximately a thousand times per month in the Arizona area where the brand was known and that brand was used to drive sales of furniture, but was most likely never searched for in the Bonton store zip codes. So I was able to prove that the trademark Stone Creek was not searched for in the Bonton trading area. Um, and additional research and analysis showed that Stone Creek did not drive the sale of the furniture. So although my client was selling furniture, you know, this tool and others that I used really helped show that it wasn't because of that trademark. Traditionally, both parties in the dispute would have uh, relied entirely on traditional consumer surveys, uh, which one was actually used in this case, or maybe gathered evidence uh, by you know, customer interviews. And these types of old world evidence alone can be problematic for many reasons. And the addition of these internet analytic tools can help fill the gaps with important internet brand metrics. This is the copy of the judge's order ruling that there were no damages in the case. The judge relied on a combination of traditional survey and my analysis of search data in his ruling. And the findings were, Consumers in the Bonton trading territory were unaware of Stone Creek. Most Google searches for Stone Creek furniture originated in Arizona. The number of Google searches for Stone Creek website from the Bonton trading area were small. Stone Creek had no brand awareness in the Bonton trading area, and there was no actual confusion by consumers in the Bonton trading area purchasing Stone Creek furniture. So again, this was a combination. There was a lot more to my report. And as I said, there was a consumer survey, but this is one of the tools that really helped out in this assignment. Um, so in a nutshell, data from the Google search tools helped clarify the economic impact of the use of the trademark and assisted in proving that although the defendant did use the plaintiff's trademark, there were no damages. This is, this is fascinating. It's very interesting, actually. And always good to see that the, the traditional surveys that we all know and, you know, have, have their issues are, are being supplemented by some more data-driven tools like, like uh, the, the, the Google uh, keyword uh, search tool. Uh, how receptive are, well, obviously, this judge was, but in, in your experience, how receptive are courts in general to this type of tools coming into um, trademark litigation? And it's a good question because early on when testifying, you know, related uh, to using these tools, uh, I found some, some of my opinions fell flat because I think the judge and jury didn't really understand the importance of the internet and social media for businesses today. So I've kind of modified my uh, approach when I'm writing a report or testifying, where the very first part of my narrative or my written report is educating the judge and jury as to the importance of internet and social media for businesses today. You know, you need to move your audience beyond that the internet and social media is, you know, for cute videos of your kids and cats uh, to show that yeah, th these are very serious, um, you know, business tools. Then I get into explaining and educating how search works 
and how Google bots crawl and index websites and why websites show up on the first page of Google results. It's not an accident. You know, they're very receptive to the tools, but what I think what needs to be done is you need to educate uh, then you need to get into what these tools are and what they do and you get into your findings, then move into your damages. You know, and uh, any comment about uh, where do you see, um, and we've seen a lot of things that are already futuristic. So, uh, but, but anyway, where would you, where would the tools need to go or how do you see the future of some of these internet um, data tools? Um, maybe we'll start with you, Ken, just go, go over the ground. Um, Sure. I mean, so, you know, think about where I started uh, 25 years ago and the tools I had then, you know, we, we were, was early in starting to use data analytics uh, for even trademark work, right? Um, and, and there's an evolution and a progression of how do we, how do we use these to make business decisions to supplement the legal decision making and the business decision making. So the evolution of where we're going is this is uh, the path where everybody becomes somewhat of a data scientist. I mean, there is there is an evolution that is happening, and we are seeing more and more of my students coming in with questions and interest in this area. It becomes a way to supplement your this business and legal decision making, and it's happening now. It's pretty exciting. Okay. Um, Dave, how about you? What kind of the future? I agree. Uh, I think the um, the workflow improvements are significant, um, especially looking at uh, our AI trends. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to use uh, uh, AI to better cluster, you know, data for review, as well as um, you know, you know, change from a simple uh, data tables to data-driven reporting, you know, visualization, um, tools, analytics, uh, customized reporting, uh, those types of things. Um, I, I agree, that's, that's the trend, especially in, uh, in our uh, team, uh, that's where we're thinking. And in terms of value transparency, um, I noted earlier that it just seems to be bumping along um, and there are so many players in the area of trans, um, transparency uh, or reporting of license agreements. I mean, there's uh, the companies themselves that are involved in licensing. There's the uh, financial reporting under FASB, uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, uh, the International Financial uh, Reporting Standards, uh, the SEC. So there's a lot of players involved in the uh, release of additional licensing information and IP value transparency. But each of these uh, players is responsible to investors. So ultimately it's the investors uh, that need to press for more transparency going forward uh, so they can make better investment decisions. And um, I'm seeing that in, uh, the uh, I'm seeing a, 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 a collapse uh, or a slowing in the um, um, investor influence in these areas. It's more uh, driven by uh, the companies and financial reporting and the SEC. But investors need to uh, speak up, and I'm looking forward to the future of uh, those uh, requesting more transparency. Yeah, I couldn't agree more about more transparency. That that debate has been going on for for decades, and right. uh, nothing has really changed. Nothing has uh, changed. Yeah, it, nothing has yeah. changed. Yeah, I, I sometimes wonder if it's easier for companies to to have this data not reported. But that, that's a discussion for a different <laughs> that's panel. Good point. But it's yeah. it's the investors that have to lead the way, and yeah, demand the I data. Agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sam, uh, any last? Famous sure. I just <laughs> pretty much reiterating everything Kent and uh, Dave just said, uh, uh, you know, it, we're, uh, we're all on the same page here, I guess, just very quickly, I would say if, if the next 12 months is a lot about collecting all these other different data types to, to make them available. Um, and if five years from now is maybe finally, that's when we really see the truly sophisticated AI 
ML um, sort of processing, being able to say, hey, I think more likely than not, the, these, these two documents are related and you need to take a look at them for decision-making purposes. I think that the interim that I'm excited about it is kind of making sure there's practical workflows, practical use cases for the types of data we're assembling and, and being able to get those to the right people. Um, like Dave said, whether it's investors or you know, in my case, the UN policymakers, um, you know, making sure that, hey, like there's some meaning, this is just a stack of data that we've given you and now you can kind of search through yourself. We're, we're correlating that for you. We're saying, hey, this, this researcher at this university who's one of the top researchers or top, top institutions happens to also be um, looks like he's a, a co-inventor on patent applications and we can trace that back to startup data. Um, isn't that interesting? You know, there, there must be some kind of relationship here, even though geographically um, it wouldn't have been, been obvious. Th those sorts of uh, workflows are actually meaningful to decision makers. And, and I think the, um, you know, the folks uh, like Pat Snap and like Richardson Oliver Insights and, and, and Dave um, will be working on that to make sure that we can make that, that information useful to decision makers. Um, Dan. Final words from you. You you are the future. So yes. <laughs> uh, still. <laughs> well, I, I think that because these internet and social media analytic tools exist, I think co a company's brand needs to be optimized for the internet. And I think that you know a companies, corporations will continue to you know register their trademarks, patents, and copyrights, but they're going to also have to have their matching domain names and social media accounts. Then I think to take that a bit further, I think that, you know, uh, those accounts are going to have to be optimized and, you know, you're going to have to figure out ways to appear in the top three, you know, organic search results. And then when it comes time for maybe a merger acquisition sale or purchase of a company, you know, those search engine optimization plans uh, need to be proven and then valued. I think there's a big difference uh, for a company that has a website and social media uh, accounts uh, compared to the, a similar company that is optimized and shows up in the search results, you know, for the most important search terms. So I, I used to joke about uh, trademarks when you have a bad mark and you, you, you have to tell the CEO that they have a bad mark, it gets the same emotional reaction as <laughs> telling the CEO that their children are ugly. Right, so oh, no. <laughs> it's a it's a brutal conversation to have, and now Doug has proven that the CEO's children are ugly, yeah. and, and now you have to manage that emotional reaction. And we have to like it's not just about the data analytics; it's how do we incorporate this into business, this storytelling, decision making, and helping people along through this process. So one of the other challenges we may know the answer. How do we help other people take action on that answer? I think that's the future. Yeah, well I think said. it's all about data-driven decision-making, which I think has been the theme throughout, uh, including your patent uh, pricing data and where people get, get attached to some expectations that they have that have nothing to do with reality. So uh, it's hard to argue with data, as you know. Well, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Uh, great. Thank you, everyone, for your insightful comments today. And we're going to move on to uh, the live Q&A here. So I'm going to stop the recording now.